They told me you were dead. I've been a little bit too busy to be dead. What happened? We are, it says recording, cool. Um, hey guys, uh, this is Brooke Monroe. And um, for those of you that don't know me, I am a film and media composer. Um, I recently uh, finished um, mixing and mastering the uh, original soundtrack release of the upcoming feature film, Sarah. And today I actually have the writer director, Kyle Plummer here. And uh, we figured we'd just do a little bit of chatting. And um, the reason for this chat is because um, at the time of recording this, we are actually releasing uh, the first single for uh, the soundtrack for Sarah called uh, Symphony for Sarah. And that's coming out um, on December 28th. And we're gonna kind of just dive into it quickly and, and kind of talk about uh, Kyle's process uh, for um, kind of picking, selecting the, the vibe for the music that we do there and uh, kind of my approach to putting it together. So, and, oh, hi. Yeah, hey, Kyle, <laughs> thank you for, uh, thanks for coming and chatting with me tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I guess well, the format we'll do is we'll do uh, one question per, just kind of taking turns. To everybody watching, I'm Kyle, I'm Kyle Plummer, uh, writer and director of Sarah, uh, student uh, feature film that I produced while attending DSU in St. George, Utah. Um, it's my, you know, so it's my th senior thesis film. Um, to many of my teachers chagrin, it's a feature, <laughs> which uh, gave them all a headache, but I'm, uh, I'm pretty proud of it. And um, working here with Brooke, and uh, this is our second time working together. Yeah. Technically, Cause we were, he scored a documentary. My brother Carlos and I worked on together uh, through our production name, Super Image LTD um, called Becoming Rich. And that was about Rich Ferguson who lives here in San Luis Obispo or lived here he doesn't anymore but um yeah that was a fun project and yeah. now we're working on getting sarah out there it's uh out to submit it to film festivals so we're waiting to hear back hopefully we'll be hearing back from some soon january um but until then we are going to be teasing the soundtrack out do a couple singles and then hopefully get the album out close to when uh it hopefully premieres at its first film festival yeah. So I guess Brooke um, want to tell people about um, kind of what your reaction was to uh, maybe seeing the film for the first time and, and trying to wrap your head around what your creative process was going to be going into this. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the first time, I mean, it's so funny because uh, thinking about it now, it's it feels like a while ago since... Um, seeing, you know, I saw a few different iterations of, of the film and, um, and totally, I, I think, you know, it, it, it felt very cohesive every time I saw a new cut, but um, I thought what was really fun about Sarah, which is going to be, you know, ultimately this definitely, um, and I'm only going to speak for myself, I won't speak for Kyle on this, but it was, um, my take on it was that this felt definitely like a psycho thriller um, of sorts that um, was really um, intriguing because you had these two characters that, um, you know, without giving anything away, um, they, they very much are, um, you know, kind of opposites of sorts, yet they're still connected through the story. And um, there's the way that Kyle framed um, his story and the film in particular uh, was really intriguing and, and really um, kind of left me thinking, you know, 
what's going to happen? How are these, how is this all related? Um, what, what is, you know, what's going to be the takeaway at the end of all of this? And in doing so, um, you know, I think a lot of questions were raised. I think tonally, um, the, the film and the story really did have a good sense of like, um, what do we, you know, uh, there's just like an eeriness to it and an unsettling tone um, that kind of gets under your skin. And in our first conversations, that was really um, at the core of a lot of, uh, maybe not the melodic structure of the film, but, you know, just kind of what was, you know, what's, what's the meal that we're cooking and what are the ingredients we're cooking with? And I think a lot of those ingredients were, you know, finding sounds and textures um, and things like that, that we could really kind of give, um, give the film. Um, and so a lot of times you're not necessarily um, hearing the music, you're feeling it. Um, and then there's gonna be other times. And in the case of Symphony for Sarah, which is the first single, um, that is definitely where the music really comes um, to the forefront. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Kyle, what, um, you know, what was the genesis for you in deciding um, totally what you wanted to do for Symphony for Sarah? And maybe you can explain to everybody why we picked this track and kind of what this track actually is. Um, well, it kind of start well it's it, it goes way way back to the fact that i'm a huge uh movie soundtrack nerd uh you know i, I i've always loved listening to movie soundtracks growing up um and one movie that i remember standing out growing up was um the king's speech um really excellent movie and the big climax of the movie uh is set to the beethoven seventh second movement and I remember watching that and my family was like, wow, it's a great, that was like the first time we had like understood and appreciated that this piece of music was special. Like, okay, cool. And that kind of just stayed in my head. And I, I had in high school, I played in um, a local youth symphony and I played violin. I, pl I, play, I played in orchestras in, in school and in college. So there's definitely still also like a real great appreciation for classical music and uh, understanding that on a deeper level, but also, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm wearing a David Fincher shirt right now. Um, I'm a big fan of The Social Network and the musical score by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, and they do a Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross version of In the Hall of the Mountain King, and that, when that soundtrack dropped in, like, 2010, uh, that blew my mind, that, like, you can take a classical music track and reinvent it but like that, that was very cool, but also how it was a very specific use. It wasn't just to do it, just to do it. It fit with the themes of the movie. And when I, I've always known I've wanted to use the Beethoven piece ever since watching the King's speech, I'm like, I want to incorporate it in somehow to something I work on someday. And there were actually a couple shorts I did in at school, a film school where I tried I, I tried to force it and it didn't work. Um, so I, I just kept saying, nope, I'm gonna save it. Nope, I'm gonna save it. And it didn't even happen until I started cutting it together. Now, when I was at school, I cut together a real rough cut to get my grade for the capstone class. Um, and so I used the school's uh, production music library. And part of their production music library was a library of classical licensed tracks and Beethoven seventh was in there so I was perusing the school's catalog and I was in there I'm like hmm maybe I could give it a try and so I did I used it in actually the um a scene towards the middle of the film or uh, at the at the first time I tried incorporating the piece and it like it almost worked but it still didn't feel right um when it's like there's the big reveal in the middle of the movie and instead I put it I was I kept cutting kept cutting and then I went to I got to the scene where where it's the climax of the movie and I was like oh let me put it here and it 
worked beautifully. And I, it, it was one of those instances where it almost was like the scene was then made for it without me even having to really re reinvent anything. And that's when I knew I was like, okay, I really want to pursue something in this direction at the very least. If we can do the social network thing of reinventing a classical piece, that would be cool. So when I started talking with you, Brooke, um, that was one of the first things when, uh, I gave to you was like, hey, I really, all this is uncharted territory, except for this part. I want to do this part this way. We at least knew we had that to tackle. But um, gosh, it was like September. I wrapped filming in April of 2019. And I met with you in September of 2019, I think was when we first sat down and met. But like, we didn't really sit down and start listening to your like those ingredients you're talking about until January of this year. But it was this year has been such a year that it feels like that was like yeah. last year. Yeah, and it, you know, um, I, I vividly remember going through the whole film, and and we we're um, doing our spotting session. Um, mm -hmm. And for those of you that are, are unaware of what a spotting session is, that's where uh, the director and the composer we get together, and essentially um, we have conversation about the film. We watch the film. We um, break down all the scenes that um, the director, in this case Kyle, has. Um, kind of a vibe for the music. Um, some directors will um, edit their film without any music and just kind of get the natural pacing of the scenes that they want. And then other times, um, and in this case, uh, you know, as Kyle mentioned before, he selected uh, music that felt like would fit the film from beginning to end to which all of it will be replaced. It's more just to kind of give an overall tone and vibe uh, more so to kind of give a vibe for the scene as a whole, not necessarily because they know they're going to keep the music in there. And so, uh, you know, through conversations, we we tackle, you know, what what is the big takeaway of this scene? What is the uh, subtle nuances? What you know, and everything in between. And um, we ultimately ended up doing, um, you know. Uh, finding and creating some really cool music that I, I personally would never have written all on my own. I mean, everything that I created is stemmed off of our conversations of what we're trying to do. Um, now in the case, I, and this is where it's very vivid, I remember when you had told me, uh, you know, when we get to the scene um, where we hear Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 7, uh, and he said, yeah, uh, you know, I want to keep this. And at first, you know, internally I'm thinking, oh, cool. Like, we're just going to, you know, <laughs> we're just going to use one of these recorded takes and you're just, you know, the licensing's a lot easier on older, um, you know, classical works. And I figured, okay, cool. We'll just have that in there. And then I realized like, no, you actually mean you, you wanted to rework the piece, but do it in a way that um, reflects the overall tone, like the tone and the sound and the soundscapes that we've already created for the film and do a new rendition of it. Yeah. So, you the know, ingredients. the ingredients. And, and so while I did not compose Symphony for Sarah, um, you know, it was a full, a new arrangement of it. I studied the score, I broke it down. Um, and there's still key orchestral elements that we recorded in there with cello and violin, violas, basses, things like that, some brass. Um, but then, you know, with the real intriguing part, um, you know, for me and the real challenge was, okay, you know, you're trying to create a classical bridge of, you know, symphonic elements and marry it with the other sounds of the film. Now for you guys, you guys haven't seen the film and this is gonna be your first taste of the music as well. Um, but I think when you listen to the score or at least listen to Symphony for Sarah, you're gonna get a pretty good vibe of what the sound of the music is like because um, we do some fun things with the piano. Um, the real compelling parts are finding either 
just household objects. Um, I took a tape gun and I stretched it out and recorded it and turned it into like a little rhythmic crackly thing that gets under your skin. Um, you know, I, I took uh, like the sound of a church bell and added a bunch of distortion on it and mixed it really low in there. But when there's these big hits, um, it really just helps kind of punch things through. Uh, I created some new synth sounds, um, you know, from my guitar and from, um, you know, my keyboard, and, you know, pitched them in a way that it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, rather than buying a new synthesizer or buying uh, a new plugin, I could, I could kind of craft it on my own. And so a lot of the score for Sarah in general was to, was, um, inspired by, you know, kind of what, what um, you were saying, Kyle, where we are um, breaking the rules a little bit. We understand what the rules are, um, yeah. kind of how Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross does uh, for a social network. And, you know, and, and those composers, they're, they're so groundbreaking because they, they understand um, story but they also understand how to really bend our perception of what music is in film. Yeah, um, And that kind of gave us permission to, to do the same for our film and to um, really try to flip things around in a way that um, hopefully makes sense for the scenes at hand um, but also um, kind of stays true in this case with a classical Beethoven piece, because, you know, when I first heard you tell me that you want this in the, the song or this track in the film, and I had that realization of, oh, you mean like I have to do a new version of it. I had an oh crap moment. Like, I can't do that. I didn't, I don't know if I told you I couldn't do it, but like internally, I, mean, I was like, oh my gosh. And I just remember. I knew it was a tall order. Yeah. <laughs> you said it, you said it was going to be a tall order. And I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this. Um, I think I told myself that. And um, thankfully, we didn't start with that. We, right. we, 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 did, we didn't. Um, sometimes I, I like to start films, you know, with scoring from the beginning and, you know, work your way through the film till the end. We actually took another big scene and started writing from, from that in the middle of the film and then kind of went backwards and worked our way up. So um, Symphony for Sarah was, is, was one of the later tracks that we worked on, which was really important because at that point we did know what the, the tone of the film was. And actually I, I, I wasn't creating new sounds at that point. I had already established a lot of new sounds. Um, and that was a cool thing too, is we had enough time to where I spent maybe two or three weeks just creating new sounds, sounds that, um, me singing inside of a uh, a large 4500 gallon empty wine um right fermenting yeah. tank um the sounds of um i i have a cello over here that i really don't know how to play um <laughs> but uh I, it was gifted but it to comes me. in handy but it really does come in handy because my wife and uh my two young daughters they gifted to me last year for my birthday and I sampled it. I just recorded me playing different ways and different things and added distortion and, and saturation and, and um, reverb and all these things and detuned it and retuned it. And um, a lot of that sound of that cello, because you hear it in the score and it's really prevalent. And, you know, doing things like that, I turned up, um, I turned a snare drum. I, I was gifted a snare drum last year and um, the top half is missing um, the top snare. So it's uh, just the bottom snare. And I hit it and I recorded it. I was like, I'm gonna just mess around with this be just because, and um, there wasn't anything too fascinating with the sound, but I was in a very experimental mood. And I ended up doing a lot of processing to the point where I actually turned it into like a low sub bass kind of thing and actually there is a very terrifying scene in the film where I use that and um, it, it, you would never expect it to be this high snappy snare when in late 
you know, in this other cue, it's like this like just kind of gets into you, you at that point when you hear it you don't know if it's your actual heartbeat or or it, or it's what you're hearing on the on the speakers so um one thing that's pretty was pretty cool is have you had a chance to check out your uh the blu-ray yet uh no um yeah like shout out to the the team that's helping us put together the the sarah blu-ray which will be coming uh after the festival run um the dvd copycat the they did a really excellent mix of the movie like because they do they do an audio pass before mastering it to blu-ray and i i had done a test blu-ray of my own here and it was like it just flattened the audio and it did not sound good oh no they did a great job though and especially like those bits that you're talking about it doesn't overpower but it really comes across crisp and clear and that bass really hits especially during the symphony for sarah it sounds excellent that's great so i can't wait i can't wait for people to not only see it uh hopefully through whatever film fest medium is around in 2021 um but also when we eventually do the the online and blu-ray release so that'll be cool that's great well since um you know since we are wrapping up our time here um this evening i wanted to ask you um since our time working um, together on Sarah and in particular Symphony for Sarah, was there anything in that process that inspired you or kind of gave you either the confidence or courage to take things, um, you know, step forward or a step further next time, you know, you're working on your next uh, feature or short film? I think definitely, you know, you learn every project you learn for the next one. And Sarah was the first time I ever tackled something longer than 20 minutes that wasn't a documentary. Um, and I mean, it, it, I jumped in the deep end and looking back on it, I'm like, how did I do that? But like, I did it and I did it all by myself as far as like, I didn't really have I had the support of, of the school for the equipment and the resources and uh, locations and the cast. But other than that, I did not have a lot of support. I didn't have financial support. I had to, uh, you know, get that Kickstarter to get everything finalized. But it was great. I mean, it was a great experience, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, and now, now, not only, I think, I think the biggest takeaways. Are, are just the disciplines, you know. Um, working on a project like Sarah really forces you to be more disciplined and realize, oh, we were lazy here and it shows, you know. So I watch things on my end, like from the photography end where I was like, I didn't check, you know, these different details. And I'm a, I was a student, I was learning. I'll always be a student, I'll always be learning. And now you know just stuff we've shot over the summer we did a, a couple videos uh were like semi-documentary style about you know the year 2020 um as well as just other interviews and other um projects we've been working on over the fall uh it definitely i see a difference i see growth and the other thing that i i really pick up on is that um just in general, like I just worked working with you, I've learned a lot just about mixing the audio mixing end, you know, and that's something that, you know, if I can give advice to anybody who's watching who wants to go into, you know, filmmaking or anything, your your sound is gonna be what saves you. Your music and your sound mixing, that is gonna be what saves you. It doesn't matter how good your footage looks. If it <laughs> sounds like crap, it's gonna look like crap. Um that's that's the biggest takeaway. And now um, we're working on a, a top secret project, but it's a possible uh, future feature. Uh, so we're Carlos and I are working with someone uh, on a script. Uh, it's a, it could be a pretty exciting project, and I definitely would not be able to tackle it unless I had done Sarah. So, and I hope to be uh, working with Brooke again uh, very soon. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm already ready. <laughs> and hopefully Sarah will be coming to, to a film festival online near you sometime soon. 
yeah, we'll uh, we'll be posting more videos. And as we get closer into um, the release of Sarah, um, we do have a follow up single that we'll be releasing uh, down the road. I'm sure we'll talk about um, the process of that as well. And then I think um, you know, if if you guys are digging it, we'll we'll do a couple more series where we talk about um, you know, and maybe we can branch out and not just do the music, but we can maybe get some of the actors in there and. Um, pretty awesome you know and, and just you know kind of have conversations about it because everyone kind of comes into a film like this in uh, various capacities and i think it's yeah. it's it's important that we all uh learn from each other as creators um as to you know how people go about what they do i only see the performance of the actors um, but I don't really get to hear or see much in the way of, you know, what their process is, is in Absolutely. taking ownership of, um, of their performances, of their characters. Um, you know, we all, other than you, Kyle, who you have the job of directing all of this, everyone else, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we all are, you know, are, are all small parts um, that make up a much larger picture in yeah. general. And so um, I think what we'll do is after um, we conclude this, we'll, um, we'll play uh, maybe the trailer of, of Sarah. So you guys can kind of get, get a chance to see what uh, visually um, a tease of what, what Sarah is all about and um, maybe wrap that up with a, um, you know, if you guys haven't heard the the, the single yet, um, Symphony for Sarah, uh, you guys will be able to check it out as well. So, awesome. yeah. In the meantime, I... enjoy Symphony for Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>